Listen up. <laughs> here we go. Yeah, man. Rap Radar Podcast, Elliot Wilson. Let's be that. Yo, man, we here with the legendary Andre Harrell. Harrell, yes, what up, baby? Right. I'm good. Can I call you, you Dre, sir? Yeah, you call me Dre. No, you got <laughs> to call him birthday boy. Happy belated? Belated, but yesterday. Thank oh, you. man. How'd you Thank celebrate? You. Uh, to be honest, I just rested up. I was tired from the trip into L.A. and doing radio all yesterday. Oh, man. I didn't do anything big. I just... You working because of this revolt, man. Puff got yeah. you working, man. This guy, yeah, yeah this guy <laughs> got a lot. You used of to make him, parts. used to make him work hard. Now you making, mm-hmm. he's making you work hard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm going what? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going in the jungle, coming out with the lion's head. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in charge of this revolt conference, man. Third yes, year, right? Third year. It's a combination of music, social media, and technology, uh, promoting music innovation. And we bring over 70 panelists up, down, and we bring about 15 different new and upcoming artists. And then we always give away the big award. This year, we're giving the uh, award to uh, Nas, and it's called Ooh, the Revolt wow. Jimmy Iovine Icon Award. And Nas will be the first artist to get I saw it. you bigging him up, and I think in the Breakfast Club thing, you were talking about how he had the Queensbridge Ventures. A lot of cats don't yeah. know that Nas is about his business. How did you hear that? That didn't even come on the radio. You, you was up there? No, it was on the uh, Breakfast Club. I think I saw the video. He was just big enough Nas. Queens really? Bridge I Ventures. just did that this morning. Oh, okay. Oh, no, no. Maybe the previous interview, you also bigged him up. That's probably what it was. Okay. Okay. You like that Nas guy? Nah, I like Nas. <laughs> Nas is cool. Because that's the thing about we're going back to your history with Uptown. Like, you were very selective. You Like, you look at the roster. You wasn't like, you, you don't give compliments out. You're very selective, high level of taste. So, the fact that you keep bigging up Nas, I just think it's a... You know, he's earned that at this you pay, point. You paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> you, you paying attention for real. Yeah, I like Nas. I, I really got to know him after um, I moved out to L.A. and um, I became the vice chair of Revolt. We started to bump into each other more. And um, yeah. I've always appreciated his work as an artist. But then once I got to know him, he's really a smart cat. Mm, yeah, Really, you know, pro-black, really about his business, really doing interesting things. Like, the fact that he got... Queensbridge venture capitalist, like yeah. with our guy set, Anthony Soleil. You know, yeah, he's yeah. start. He's setting a new standard for what a rap star can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a fucking venture capitalist. Venture capitalist, yeah, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, and a vicious MC, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, with the Revolt Music Conference, how like what do you think has been growing over the last two three years? I think because there's really no other real music conference that the record business supports. So we get, like, the first year we gave it to Jimmy Iovine after he went to Apple. Mm -hmm. Can't get any bigger than that. Right. Last year we gave it to L.A. Reid. So we we tried to get um, the people in tech involved. We tried to get the people in social media involved. And and when I say that, we tried to get the founders involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's kind of like a tech conference meets Jack the Rapper. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because talk serious. about those for people that don't know. You would hear about these legendary conferences that mm-hmm. we knew about in the '90s, like "How Can I Be Down, Jack the Rapper." B-R-E. What do you think? What do you think differentiates Revolt from from those times what in the, this new era? What the is, difference is one: radio was the driving uh, factor behind the other conferences. Mm. What happened was major labels would fly in, big time program directors, and then all the other labels would go and support and have showcases for their artists. Now it's not so much terrestrial radio. Now it could be streaming, terrestrial radio, and social media that get the buzz out. Mm. So now we, we, we've messed it up across the board with all three of them. Plus we still do a r plus we still do management, plus we do keynote speaks like this year. Leor Cohen from 300 is doing a keynote speech. Oh, boy. Right. Do you have a Leor impression, Andre? Would you like people to do a Leor impression? I can't really do a Leor impression <laughs> right now, but I can tell you this, 300 is hot. <laughs> it's hot. What have you heard, Dre, about 300? You don't know. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> is it hard to get these power players down to you my You get end? everybody, man. To be honest, it's not that difficult. Like, <laughs> wow. To be honest, so is it all, really like, do, you, do you don't even rely on Puff? This is all your juice to this get this all happen. Me. This is all me getting on the phone yeah. and asking them to do it. And um, we've all came up in a time where we all gave back. Yeah. So from Leor to Russell to myself, we all were involved in BRE. We all were involved in Impact. We all were involved in How Could I Be Down. Like when Peter Thomas first did How Could I Be Down, he called me up and said, I got an idea for a conference in Miami. I want to honor you this year. I need your support. And I did. Like, yeah. if mm-hmm. these things are good for the record industry. Yeah. Like, 
artists get developed, artists get discovered, record executives get discovered and move forward. So how does it usually work for the new generation that goes to these events? Like, what's the type of energy you peep? Like, how is that different than the past? I think, I think uh, the opportunity for the new generation is to hear what the panelists got to say, the people who are in the game, but to hear it from a different perspective in the sense that the game is changing every day. Mm. So you got to go to the tech panel and hear what iCloud is saying. You got to go hear what Spotify is saying. You got to go hear uh, what terrestrial radio is saying. And you got to go hear what 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 uh, L.A. Reid is saying. Like, And you got to take it all in and si- figure out where you fit in. Before when we were kids, it was a simple path. We wanted to be A&R director, so we wanted to be pro yeah. men. Mm. That's it. Now there's so many uh-huh. things to be inside the record business or outside. You might want to go work at Apple now, yeah, as opposed to working at Epic. Yeah, it's because it, no, we more were talking choices. about that. If you look at we had Kevin Lyles as the last guest. He went from intern to CEO. Mm-hmm. Your protege Puff went from intern to CEO. That seems like a whole other lifetime Universe. that you couldn't do that in this era. Like really go from an intern to a CEO of a company. And one of the reasons you could do that back then is because we were boutique companies. So you could have a personal relationship with the president. And he could give you more responsibilities that you could take from first to home plate. Yeah. Mm. Like now, well, even back then, if you went to a major label, everything is departmentalized. Yep. And you could only do the what your department. department. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and at boutique labels, we did everything. Yeah. Artwork, video, a and marketing, whatever it is, we did everything and everybody had a voice in it and it was very important that people understood what the point of view of your label was. Hmm. Not you, just the artist, but when, the label. When, but observing Puffy in that era, like when was the first time you kind of really started to realize, okay, this guy, there's something unique about this kid. Like he seemed like he's bringing a different type of energy to this First place. time, First time I sent him on an errand, uh, I was on the phone. Let's I get rid of this, whatever this is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I sent him. I sent him on an errand to Unique Studios to pick up some tapes. We we were housed on Fifty Seventh Street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was on the phone. He ran, got the tape. He ran back, and his tie was like this when he came back. <laughs> <laughs> what else can I do for you? I, I said to myself, Oh, this boy's a problem. He said, I ran there and I ran back. I was like, okay, that's a different kind of energy. (laughs) (laughs) And I kind of thought, this kid is special. Like, his desire, Mm -hmm. his his go out and get it was special. Right. So if a person wanted to come to the music conference, do they get hired on the spot? Do you think people have lofty expectations going into the conference? Uh, I don't think they get hired on the spot. If they did, they don't think it right now. (laughs) Uh, What you do, you make inroads to network for future opportunity or to get your record deal. One thing we're doing different is um, a lot of times when people came to the conference, they would uh, come up after a panelist spoke and say, and have a question. So the moderator would say, okay, what's your question? And they said, I don't really have a question, but I'd like to audition. And they sing or they start spitting bars. Yeah. So instead of having that, we we just decided to give a day for the people who are trying to get discovered. And we call that Be Heard. And so myself, Brian Michael Cops, uh, Cool and Dre, uh, we're going to be down there hosting the Be Heard, and people will come and audition for a minute and a half or so until we get down to 10 people in the final hour, and we're going to pick one person as the winner, and that person will perform on Revolt live. Oh, wow. Damn. That's a pretty so good deal. That, that particular thing you could get on. <laughs> <laughs> but don't be trying to freestyle at these panels, man. No, no gonna catch your mic. ask questions at the <laughs> panels. If you want to freestyle, come the first day, Thursday, to Be Heard. All right. And the conference is October 13th to the 16th down in Miami at the Eaton Rock Hotel. Why Miami every year? Who don't want to go to Miami? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's local. It's easy to get to. It's beach. It's Bonique was. What else? You remember the first That's time? like the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> With beach. With the beach. Remember the first time you balled out in Miami? Um, or you discovered remember, the power of Miami? I remember How Could I Be Down? 1995. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, Miami was always special. And that's our guy. He's in reality shows now, right? Yeah. That's, yeah t- Peter talk, Thomas. Peter Thomas, yeah. Peter Thomas. People don't realize that. Mm-hmm. Pedigree. Wow. Crazy. So, what I want to know is, what are your thoughts on the industry these days? Like, are you a fan of subscription-based services and things of that nature? I think uh, Beats is kind of interesting, and I think Pandora is interesting. I like Pandora because I can just go Michael Jackson Radio, Barry White Radio, R. Kelly Radio, and just let it go, and I can get 
that kind of music. And I don't have to keep bending forward and creating playlists. Mm -hmm. I like that the old man in me likes that. <laughs> now, Beats, Beats got all kinds of playlists, all kinds of yeah, DJs. Apple Music, they got that Best of Uptown yeah. Records. Yeah, they got that. <laughs> so they got playlists, they got, they got uh, DJs with particular points of view, like Q-Tip, like Drake. They got, I, I think what they got is worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would spend my money on that. Right. And I do. <laughs> but how does that affect, do you think it does leave a dent on like old school brick and mortar services going to Best Buy and, you know, picking up an album? Like, Oh, okay. When it comes to record stores and us not having record stores, that's, that, 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 um, I miss that. Mm. I miss going and looking at the album covers and picking through the stuff. That was a whole experience. Yeah. Right. Um, but how long has it been going now? Like six, seven, eight? Yeah. More than that? Yep. Gotta let that go. You gotta let that go. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about that. Part of what you built with Uptown Records uh, was all about the imaging and the style that was so important. Mm -hmm. Like, talk about the construction of that. And at the time, like, even putting Mary J. Blige in those type of outfits was, was almost controversial, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when I started Uptown Records, I had already been a rapper. I was already been in Dot Jekyll. You want to pull up my champagne and rap album right here? <laughs> Dot Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Right. So let me do one to my AM, PM, all, all that night long. long. Put your radio up because we are on. So I had that experience <laughs> from a kid. And we were like a Harlem rap group. So I studied, like, I used to go to Pro Rucker and I would study the attitude. So their attitude was ghetto fabulous. Mm. And I was like, now imagine if you can have all these trimmings and you were legal. Like the hustlers used to um, have the teens back then when we go to Pro Rucker. It would be it'd be Smokey the Freak. It, it would be Tito, uh, Nicky Barnes' nephew. And they would come with jewelry and Benzes and they, you know, have an attitude like it's nothing. Yeah. And I would say to myself, imagine if you could do that legal. What kind of attitude would that look like? And so when I got in the music business, first thing I did was try to do that attitude on mm. guy, uh, Mary J. Blige was the girl version of that with yep. the door knocker earrings. And attitude plus style plus talent was really what Uptown Records was about. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. we really wouldn't sign just a person who had talent but didn't have an attitude and didn't have style. Yeah. We needed the whole package. Is that the reason why you went to go see Mary in person at a, her, her own hood? And the reason I went to see her in person is because when I heard her sing, she she was like a painter with an interpretation of an experience that was different and special from everybody else. Mm. So I said, when when they told me she's not going to come down, I knew it was because she was shy. Mm. And I knew she probably didn't believe that it was true. So I went up to Snowbound Projects and went to her apartment with her mother. And I remember when I came through the door and I saw her and her moms, I told her moms, one day your daughter's going to sing for royalty. She's gonna sing for rock and roll kings and legends. She's gonna sing with them. She's got a real gift. And Mary just was shy and just laughing and thought I was just this colorful black person <laughs> talking all this Wizard of Oz and hoping, <laughs> and hoping that it would come true. Right. My little black princess. <laughs> but 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 it did come true. Right. Yeah. And it was, it was, they said Puff said it was Queen of Ghetto Love, and then you said Queen of Hip Hop Soul. That's the urban mm -hmm. legend. Is that, that how is it went the down? truth? We we were. We were trying to package her uh, and make T-shirts. T-shirts was very serious. <laughs> t-shirts were serious. Yeah. House of Pain had yeah, a T-shirt. Very, right? very serious. Very serious. So, so um, Puff came with a Ghetto Love T-shirt, and I said to Puff, "Don't nobody want to be from the Ghetto, Puff. You want to you you want to be hip hop soul." I said, "That's the term," and that turned out to be the term, and we've been riding hip hop soul. Yeah. Up until this day, but right. you but you credit Puff with the idea to kind of just take that hip hop beat yeah. with the vocals, Puff right? Came, Puff came with the sound. Yeah, he came with the hip hop. Mary had the soul, and together that was hip hop soul. Hmm. I since we're talking about Puff, I want to stay on there for a little bit. Mm -hmm. How much credit do we does Puff really deserve? Like, do we not praise him as enough? Like, sometimes I think about his career and you know him coming from you and your your tree. Like, do we give him the props that he really deserves, or is it kind of undervalued? Well, he feels underrated as a producer. I feel like that's a common theme with him. I think I think Puff probably doesn't get uh, the props for being the artist that he really is. I think um, when you look at his his body of work, 
it's not just the records he's made, it's the visuals he's made. Like mm. his video game. To me, he should have got a moon man for just his video <laughs> what's game. Your, what's your favorite video oh, yeah, of all Victory. time? Victory is like, his favorite video of all time. Plus, video game is, is hard to match. Mm. So I, I think uh, a lot of things he doesn't get all the artistic credit for that he deserves. I think in, in terms of a marketeer, uh, in terms as a visual <clears throat> creative, uh, in terms of knowing what fits, Puff, Puff has showed a particular excellence. Mm, yeah. But I do think he gets his props. The only thing I don't think he gets his props for is his visuals, his videos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think he made some of the best videos. And you give him props for really crafting that Mary J. Blige image with the first album. Talk about that What's the 411 and putting that record together. Like, What was your observations on how that record came together? I remember when they would come back to play the record for me, I would say, yo, there's no change in the record, like a regular structured song. It would just be the beat. And they said, and they would, you know, him, <laughs> ADF, uh, Dave Hall, they'd be like, yeah. And be rocking their head like, yeah. Like, Deep and, I, and, I, and, I, and I was like, okay, I guess so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they came with the no changes, just the, the knock. In terms of the arrangements, straight through. In terms through. of the arra arrangements, yes. And um, Mary had a particular uh, way of singing things, and she could rap too. Yeah, she loved to get like, them bars. Like, like Mar Mary, Mary was the real thing, the inner city treasure. Mm. <laughs> and I think it came at a time where the New Jack Swing was was dying, and hip hop was on way up, and R and B. If you were a young producer, you didn't want to make a soft sound because the hard thing was not. Yeah. So when they decided to use the same loop that they used in rap records, mm. that's when we found something. Mm. And and um, I think the very first one was uh, was the Jodeci record. Mm. It was Come and Talk to Me. The remix. Mm. Yeah. The remix. Yeah. The that EPMD, the, the EPMD type. That was type. the first hip hop soul record. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then My Life is So Revered, too. I mean, Mary's second album. Like, mm -hmm. Can you talk about what was going on at that time? And it, it sort of like it refined that sound almost, mm -hmm. with the, but it had my, more arrangements. My, my, my Life, yeah, had real arrangements. My Life. Uh, is the only album I have up in my house. Mm. Like, that wow. was a masterpiece. Wow. Because she was so honest in terms of what she was going through and her love life and how she was feeling. It almost made the company feel like, if we handle this right, we'll be helping uh, young women across the world. Because it wasn't just, love is not just an um, inner city thing where people don't get it. It's across the board. You could be rich and unloved. You could be born unloved. You could be black. You could be white. It's just a feeling of women feeling unloved and unappreciated. And my life captured that moment. And we, we tried to do our best to make sure that Mary grew with that in terms of not just musically, but as an adult. Yeah. Like, there's a responsibility that's going to happen with this album. Mm. Like, when women come up to you, Mary, they are coming up to you because they want some love from you because you understand exactly what they're going through and they haven't heard anybody else say it the way you're saying it. Mm. So you and women are about to have a love affair. Wow. How did she adjust to that? She, she, at first she was non-trusting, but then after a while she, 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 she learned how to trust because she saw it was just overwhelming. It was coming out of everywhere. Wow. Yeah. And so now when I see her, she, she knows exactly who she is and what her responsibility is. Yeah. She's the queen of hip-hop soul, and she knows that she's the beaming light of strength for women and that she's revered by women, and so she knows how to love her audience in return. Mm -hmm. Yeah. During Uptown's run, did you guys see anybody as competition, whether it was LaFace or any other record labels? I saw LaFace's competition because LaFace was selling a lot of records. <laughs> <laughs> that record was I'll hear about that bottom line, man. Right. <laughs> I remember when I put out the uh, My Life album, we sold three million, and uh, TLC put out the album that had Creep on it, it sold seven million. So was your music too black, Andre? The Uptown Records is too black. I thought <laughs> I thought MCA wasn't giving us the right money to cross it over, Pop. Uh -huh. mm. That's what I thought. So, so I that thought, began some kind of tension maybe? Yeah, I thought they should have just gave me my own pop department, but they would never want to give our urban label based in urban culture. Pop department? I have to change the game. Yeah, it was so divisive when you would go up to labels back then and be like, this is the rock post, this is the urban department. Mm. Like, it was all compartmentalized and, like, those worlds didn't meet. You met the publicists and then you was the urban publicists. And, like, 
you imagine if you segregated. Just put out a record um, with the culture of the hood and put it out to mainstream America, like put it out on ABC networks, mm. and everybody could see. All of a sudden, and and not just that one. Here's another one, and here's another one, and here comes Little Sean, and here comes Jodeci. That level of effect on pop culture, they was like, no, we're gonna control that. <laughs> because that level of effect on the bottom line, we're gonna control that too. All right. Because we know you could get to two, maybe you get to three, but if you want to get to eight, that's that's a whole nother level of money. You're gonna be telling me what to do. So were you in L.A. <laughs> Reid like battling on the phone, like yo, I got TLC, I got Joe to see. No, was yeah, it? L.A. Reid, best of friends. Right. Yeah. Best of friends the whole way. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, and in the situation, obviously, like people forget too with Puff, like you always get the rap that you you get tired of the rap that you fire Puff and all that type of stuff. Because at the end of the day, you helped build Bad Boy Entertainment while he was still there, right? I made Puff rich. <laughs> you bought him his first car. Puff, Puff was, I bought him his first car. Puff was on payroll. When he got fired, he was on payroll. Wow. I yeah. wanted to give Puff his own office because he was keeping my office open late to two in the morning. Wow. I was like, okay, champagne we, on your we, desk. We, we got to we got to give him his own space. So when I would try to negotiate with MCA to give him his own space, they said, nah, you gotta handle that. And so that bothered me, and then I, when he had the Biggie album, the president's secretary, Richard Parmesi's secretary, she was listening to it, and she was saying, we can't put this out. Oh, so she I can't remember this now, it's controversy, and, yeah. And the president called me and said, we can't put this out. And uh, you gotta tell him we gotta change it. I was like, I don't wanna be in the middle of this. I don't wanna be the one holding back the voice of a generation. So all of that led me to know that Puff was so big, it was time for him to do his yeah. thing. What was the biggest? There was a biggie song that there was, what, was party it, and bullshit. Was that no? What was the oh, one the, that was the controversial God, that um, they was concerned about? I'm um, to be honest, I, don't, I can't yeah. even tell you. Not which me one. and my bitch, maybe or something like that. I can't remember which yeah, one. Yeah. Mm. But they just thought it was kind of more violent towards yeah. women or the yeah. type of thing. I've been hearing about that. Mm -hmm. So technically, Biggie got dropped in a sense in that point. We didn't right? drop him. Uh, we would have never dropped him. I'm sorry. Um, um, <laughs> Biggie turned out to be my favorite rapper yeah. of all time. No, but it was just it was time for um, yeah. Puff to get another opportunity that MCA wouldn't allow me to give him. So he had a bad day one day, and and it just didn't work out that day. And it was just time to make a change. Yeah. But the change I made, I kept him on payroll. I kept his artists on payroll. He had Craig Mack still right. at Total. All that Big E, yeah. Craig Mack, the girl Total. And I looked over his contracts. I was like, go get the best deal. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself that after me, what I taught you, I taught you a lot of culture and lifestyle. Clive Davis, song man, yeah. teach you how to make a number one record worldwide. Mm -hmm. Go get that. You have that in your title. You look at your Twitter bio, you have one simple thing. You say record man. Why, that best represents you? Why, why do you think that best represents you? Um... Because it's it's a rarity that someone in the music business is a real record man. And I think when when we use that term, I know LA uses that term, I know Jimmy Iveen uses that term. When you're a record man, it's it kind of says you know the record business from soup to nuts. Mm. Mm. You know a hit song, you know how to work a hit song, you know what it takes to make a star. So that's what I mean when I yeah. when I say that. Has what? that changed? Has, I'm sorry. Has that, has that changed in this climate? Because that's the thing people want to know. How do you like? You, it seems like you can easily get on by just putting your record out. But then, how do you make it? How do you become a star? How do you get noticed? The way you you, you become a star is through the journey, uh, and the journey is you practice in your craft. Like you're not going to be great unless you get up there every day and swing the bat or shoot the ball. Those are the ones who end up being great. So like. When you look at Jay-Z, when you look at Kanye, you see once they got their moment, they ain't never let it go. They never turned down the heat. They never took it for granted. They turned the heat up. So the journey is really very important. Like, you got to like it. You mm. got to like the good days along with the bad days to you get better days. Mm. And a lot of times now with social media, we're in the famous game. And people just want to get famous, whether it be for records or whether it be for being naked. <laughs> and, 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 and so, and so, when 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 your goal is just to be famous, it's not so much the journey you appreciate. It's just the moment to get to that particular place. Mm -hmm. But that particular place is fleeting. Fame is fleeting unless you're able to be a part of the journey and 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 really fine tune your craft. Mm -hmm. So you got to be at it every day. You got to change your style up. 
and so forth. Like what are some keys in terms of the actual music making? Do you think that a lot of artists make mistakes in terms of when they first start making songs? Like, what do you? What is there a certain thing you look for in music that catches you? Attention? You look for you look for originality and authenticity, and the sound of their music, and the rhythm of their music, and and their voice and how they're saying what they're saying. Hmm. You look for somebody who's not a, a carbon copy of somebody else. They can remind you of someone, but not be that person. Right. Be yeah. their own person. What I want to know is, when going back to Puff real quick, he lived with you. Mm-hmm. And when you let him go, he said that he was outside your crib and you didn't let him in. No, he didn't live with me then. He didn't live with you? He, li- he lived with me in uh, New Jersey. Oh, okay. When I <laughs> bought my first million dollar crib, Puff moved in day one. <laughs> <laughs> he said, we got a nice place here. <laughs> <laughs> Take that. Yeah. 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 But when you let him go, he said you didn't let him inside the house. He said he was banging on the doors and you were home, but I wasn't home. That's what I wasn't home. <laughs> it, like he said that that was the day that it was it was done. But um the next Monday when he came in, I said, Listen, you're gonna stay on payroll. Mm. I'm gonna pay you to do the Mary J. Blige album and you're gonna get rich. Mm. And he understood that pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> he got my life as a party gift. <laughs> yeah. He understood that pretty quickly. What do you think of the, today the Mary gets some criticism with the, she had that fried chicken commercial and everybody went crazy and then I saw this clip of her and Hillary Clinton and it seemed like she was singing something about um, police brutality and just, just taken out of context in the social media like what do you think of when so people sort of try to attack her character or put her under the microscope? I, don't, I think Mary probably has the most integrity of all artists today. I think um, Mary is integrity brand number one. Like in life, we make mistakes. So I know she the chicken thing she said never was supposed to come out like that. We spoke about that. That was a couple of years ago. Yeah. She really tried to stay in her lane and give the fans what they expect from her. Yeah. Hmm. And that's the thing. She I means. What does it? What does it feel? That, what does it? Well, how does it make you feel to see someone like her or Puffy like? You know, people are successful, but like you said, they're like Jay Z and Kanye. They just keep going. They keep growing. Like, what do you think it is, and like, how, how does that make you feel? Like, and what do you think your role has been in that in terms of their growth? Um, I think my role was to show them a vision of it could be achieved mm. by achieving it. As first, me achieving it, yeah, and then telling them they can achieve it, and then they they start to achieve it, and then it's almost like Dr. J and Michael Jordan. When Dr. J came out, he was the first one dipping and grooving and rocking, <laughs> but it was new. Right. When Michael Jordan came, after watching Dr. J, he came and did it all. And then after LeBron came, he was a billion dollar ball player. <laughs> right. So each generation just gets better with the opportunity. Right. Mm. And I think that once they got the opportunity, watching it from the outside and then having it is different. Like when I did it, I wasn't watching anybody else like me. Yeah. When I did it, I was the first to do it. Or or Russell was the first to do it, or we were the first to do it. Yeah. When they came, they got a minute to watch to see, whoa, this is hot. How do we do this? Mm, yeah. And then when they when they had that plus the opportunity to do it, they was like, Ain't nothing gonna be better than this. Yeah. And everybody just kept going. So, so what was that feeling like when you got that fifty million dollars to create the uptown division of, you know, for the T V and the movies? What was that like? It was. You talking to like, a big New York undercover fan, right? It was Huge. like. <laughs> it was like we had. I had the opportunity to really move culture. Like with New York Undercover, it was the first drama to have an African American male lead and a Hispanic lead. And for those that don't know, you created New York Undercover. Correct. Right. Right. And that's Malik Yoba, and what was the other? John Leguizamo. No, it's not, no, not no, John no. Leguizamo. Excuse me. My, excuse me. <laughs> I don't like. I know what I'm talking about. It's the other guy that was in the. Uh, I forget his it's name. It's the other guy from Fame. Yeah. He was in a Michael Jackson. <laughs> Does anybody Jackson. know his Michael, name? Michael DeLorenzo. Michael DeLorenzo. There you go. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, They're going to kill me. And now. I remember I wanted to get Rodimus from Juice. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. And I remember I remember, I kept telling everybody at Fox, the chairman of Fox, Dick Wolf, my, yeah. the president of Universal, that I wanted to get Vinny. And so it was the final day. We had a meeting with 50 executives. The show was a go. And Dick Wolf said, yo, if you bring up Rodimus one more time, I'm not going to be with you. You're going to be left out, and we're going to keep moving. <laughs> and I had a I had a bad habit of saying what I wanted to say. Mm. 
But I had already said it enough times that nobody was going to do it, so it was time not to say it no more. That's what Dick Wolf had left me out. So working on that show and being able to put music in that show um, and being able to have appointment television, it moved the culture. It did. It created opportunity. And when I got that, that deal, we had uh, offices on the lot. The only person I had ever seen who had an office on the lot in music was Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. um, so it felt very empowering. Wow. And it felt like I, I, get, I gave out a lot of opportunities. Uh, Mr. Hyde, uh, Alonzo Brown, he came to work for me and headed up my television division. He then went on to write Honey with Jessica Alba. Right? Oh, wow. Didn't know that. Um, Rose Catherine, who was my executive, uh, she went on to be the president of TV One. Mm. So it gave me a lot of, of ability to give people opportunity. And it also felt like it was the first time we saw a lot of those figures go at Natalie's and perform live and mm -hmm. see them on TV. Like that was a real watershed moment, even as a kid watching it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, was a, that was one of the biggest hooks. And I remember uh, trying to convince Dick Wolf about uh, James M. Toomey to do the score. And I said, you want him to do the score because you're gonna need somebody who can remake this contemporary music. And you know, Dick Wolf is a big television guy. He was like, I don't know about that. I don't wanna do that. And I was like, <laughs> I'm digging my, my boots in the ground saying, we gotta do this, we gotta do this. And fortunately, when James M. Toomey came, his politics was such, he was so sophisticated that Dick Wolf appreciated him and we got that done. That, that, that's how Natalie came about. Wow. Because we didn't have a budget for it. Here's the score guy, and then here's another budget for us to produce records when these people come. It had to be the same person who did it. So um, Toomey was the one who was qualified enough, who had a background in music and could make anything. Wow. Like, I remember when he brought Bobby Womack down, uh, and Casey and Bobby Womack did the duet, uh, If You Think You're Lonely Now. <sighs> and that was the only time I seen Casey scared. Like, before <laughs> Casey, Casey was standing there looking at the booth, and he was looking at me. I was like, don't be scared. Don't be scared. You can sing it. And he's like, that's Bobby Womack. But he went up there and he did his job. I think he did. That's actually one of my favorite covers of all time. That and, like, I Will Always Love You. I think they're better than the originals. Jodice, Arguable. Jodeci's Lately is pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> Jodeci's Lately is pretty good. Yeah. But speaking of the unplugged, uh, why would... Uptown keep, Unplugged. Unplugged. Un, Uptown Unplugged. Can we get that on Revolt? Like, you ever thought about that's something like that? That's a classic. Do you mean to be able to air it? No, something of that nature. Well, we, 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 we just started this thing called Sessions and RPM, mm -hmm. where we, we c let artists come and play with a band. Like today, Kalani's at the studio right now playing uh, her album with a band, her EP with a band, mm -hmm. Okay, to give her that look. So we are developing music-orientated shows now. Wow, that's to, dope. To showcase artists with real talent. Well, let's talk about Town Unplug, people that don't know. That was, that was legendary. I mean, you blessed MTV with that one, but... Up to Adam Plug, <laughs> I was in um, Barbados. Hey. Me and, me and Russell and Leo, we were on Christmas vacation. I was going to say the Christmas vacation though. And um, uh, Tony Jordan called me and said, we're interested in doing an Uptown Unplug. Now, no label had ever did an Unplug or ever did it afterwards. It was yeah. only, in hip hop, it was an LL. Yeah, LL and, did it first. Mm, and yeah. I don't think there was anybody else outside of LL no. mm -mm. and hip hop. So when she called me with that, I remember Russ and Leo was sitting there. And I said that, I know their faces but they hit the ground. Because <laughs> <laughs> me and Leo especially was so competitive. Wow. Um, but when I got to do that, that was hard, man. We got Jodeci's band to play for everybody. Mm. And so heavy work Jodeci's band. Christopher Williams worked Jodeci's band. Mary worked Jodeci's band. Mm. So they was working them hard mm. to the point where the band was like, hold up now. We don't really work for you. We work for Jodeci. Yeah. So trying to keep that together <coughs> for that week of rehearsal to actually do it, that was one of the hardest things I ever did. Because yeah. I had to keep everybody's ego in check, keep the band happy, mm. keep the performance going. Yeah. By the time it happened and we had the party, I remember I was walking around the party in the days. Like, thank God it's over. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking at Patty LaBelle jumping up and down, partying, Arsenio partying. I'm like, <laughs> wow. Wow. And we had the KC Mary relationship going at that time, too, mm -hmm. with the, and the emotional performance where I don't want to do anything else. Like, yeah. How did you manage that? Like, two of your artists dating in a very volatile situation. Like, how did that affect you? Well, 
to be honest, like when two artists start dating, that has nothing to do with you. That's how they end up doing it. All you can do is manage it to the best of your situation. Yeah. Uh, so, and sometimes it was working good because KC uh, had more experience in singing, so Mary would open up and sing more around KC and made her a better singer. But we you know when it goes bad, it just goes bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. One of the okay. No, I'll say, does it sad to see at times it go bad for a group like Joe to see? You know, some people don't end up having this long career. Mm -hmm. Like, you know how talented they were, and a lot of records, even when they first came to you, they had ideas of these great records already. Like, so can you speak about their journey and how it kind of went left in some sense? Okay, um, Joe to see, they drove up eight or nine hours from uh, North Carolina and sat in my lobby. For a couple of hours, and I remember me and Heavy were, <laughs> me and me and Heavy were in my office, arguing about something. Heavy <laughs> standing over me, giant size, dictating with his big voice, telling me something. And so we kept hearing, "Come and talk to me." And like, who is this? Who is this? I'm like, I don't know who is this. So we get up, we walk around the corner, and we see these four little guys in Kurt Juice Whitley's office, who was my A and R executive. Yeah. And I said. Is this y'all singing this? Yes, sir. You know, they Southern boys. <laughs> yes, sir, Pentecostal church boys. And I was like, y'all got more records like this? And they played Forever My Lady. And I was like, okay, they not leaving. Y'all y'all are getting a, a record deal today. Wow. So we put them in a hotel, got them a lawyer. Same day? Same day. Wow. And and got them on. That's it. Trap you at the label. You ain't leaving. That was the whole thing. Leaving. We signed you. Because you might go down the block to Def Jam and get mm -hmm. a deal or something mm -hmm. like that. Wow. Somewhere else. So um, I remember I moved them in to uh, the apartment that I grew up with in the Bronx. Wow. Uh, to give them a chance to really digest the urban feel. So uh, they lived there for about four or five months and they were playing music and so forth. And they was like, I don't know if this is safe for us anymore, Dre. I said, why you say that? We had a party the other night. We had about 100 people here. They was looking at the equipment and everything. I think uh, the jig is up. Mm -hmm. And they was right. The jig was up. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and it, it was fine because it was time to put out their single. So it was time to move them away yeah. from that level of inner city. Wow. How but did, they yeah. had soaked it up. Yeah. And you could see it in their attitude and you could see it in their fashion. Wow. How did they deal with the fame of the first album? Because it seemed like it took a, there was some drama even before the second album happened, right? I think, or just it took a while. What what do you mean drama? Like I'm lost with that one. No, I just remember like I thought it was kind of a couple years break before the second album came. No, no, no? okay. The the only drama was we put out Gotta Love first. Mm. Oh yeah, they didn't like that one. And right. that's the one they liked. Oh, okay. Hint the the group Impuff came to me, lobbied me for weeks, months. <laughs> this is the single. We need to be young. We need to be street. This is it. And I always used to tell my artists, listen, as much as I know you're gonna know a little bit more about yourself. Cause I'm thinking about all of y'all. Y'all only thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you keep thinking that I'm missing something, you 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 stay at me and convince me. Cause I always put the power back in the artist's hands. Mm -hmm. So they had Puff on their side, Puff was telling them how to work me. And we put out God of Love, but God of Love was not a hit. Wow. Yeah. And then <clears throat> uh, Distribution called me and said in Washington, D.C., The Wiz, this record is number one, and forever, my lady. We should put this out. Mm. And when we put that out, the rest was history. Wow. Yeah. Why, why isn't Anthony Hamilton celebrated as an uptown artist? Like, you signed him mm -hmm. in 94. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> why? Like what? Because, because um, when his album came out, I had left and, and went over to Motown, oh, okay. and it wasn't a big hit. But me and Anthony, we always celebrate it when we see each other. We always tweet back and forth. He's an uptown artist. Can we talk about Motown? This is what I remember from me. I just started getting mm -hmm. into the industry. I started like in the mid '90s, and then like the big deals. Andre Rell's going to Motown. Mm -hmm. I just remember that ad. It was in Billboard. Uptown to Motown. Uptown to Motown. It, it's on. It's on. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was like a back of a of a chair, and like it had a Motown hoodie or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you just see the cigar. You see Andre's cigar. Like it was just mm -hmm. pop, and it was like it was just rumors about how many buckets of money Andre was given mm -hmm. and how crazy it was. So mm -hmm. was it all that at the time? To be honest, I was already a Motown for the time period. Like you grow up as a kid and you're, you're, you're idolizing what your parents idolized, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, so forth. But you can never recapture what was yeah. to today. 
what was is always going to be what it was. And what you have today is what's happening right now. So trying to chase Motown and turn it into Uptown to be relevant, uh, like Uptown was relevant, it was just not the right brand. Like Motown meant something else. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't know that. I just grew up thinking Motown was the the supreme black music label, and it was. Yeah. Like I said, it was. At that, at that period, Uptown was the supreme black music label. Mm. So it was a lot of um, hard work, and it was like chasing a ghost mm. that you could never bring to life. Once something has died, once a period has died, and a new period has ushered in, you can't bring an old period back. Mm. It seemed like after you left that, you kind of went low for a while, right? Like, what was going on at I that went, time? I went and became the head of Bad Boy Records. Okay. That's when Puff sold 12 million. Wow. No way out. So so how did that shift of, of him, now you coming back and technically, in some sense, working for him? Like, what was that transition like? It, it, was, it was fine because me and Puff always had a great working relationship. We always loved what we were doing and we always was trying to get it right get it exactly right like the image the sound the so forth so he was an artist at that point so when i came in to be president i came in to be president and like he was an artist so i i did mostly what i would do then when he came back we did again what we mostly would do together when we were working at uptown mm -hmm. this is after biggie's passing like mm -hmm. around the time mm-hmm so what was that? What was that vibe over there? Like, how was how were you guys overcoming the pain of that and really sort of building the structure? And a lot of people were surprised that Puff the artist now was taking off. That when he could do it. when when um, when um, Big got killed, I was president of Motown, mm -hmm. and Puff was staying at my house that weekend, <laughs> uh, and I came to Bad Boy a little later after that, but the loss of Big was for the industry was huge. For him it was huge, for Bad Boy it was huge, but for music it was huge. Mm -hmm. Like, he might, he was one of the greatest rappers of all time. Yeah. Right. He was so clever. Right. And so, and so uh, melodic in his approach. Yeah. He turned out to be my favorite rapper of all time. You keep right. saying that, so you, you wasn't as sold on him from the beginning, I guess? Mm -hmm. when, it, when I first heard him, I thought he was good, but I didn't know. But I had Hev D. Hev D was like my favorite rapper. Mm. Uh, have you ever used to hear me talk and promote Hev D? Shit. <laughs> give us a pitch. Give us a pitch. We're going to be Hev D. No, right but I now. feel, you know, I think unfortunately, I think because of how great Biggie was and, and then guys like Big Pun that came mm -hmm. after, Hev D doesn't get the props he deserves. You know, R.I.P. Hev. Like, talk a little bit well, about what made Hev special. I'll, I'll tell you about Hev. I remember I got an invitation to Janet Jackson's birthday party. It was going to be at Prince's Club. And I show Hev the invitation. He said, that's nice. And I said, you going? He said, why am I going? I said, you going because as soon as you get there, you're going to get in pocket with Janet Jackson. You're going to make a record. How you know that, Dre? I said, because you the bun diddly D. And when you start <laughs> dancing, <laughs> you the goes, bun diddly D. go heavy. There can't be anything, anybody else she wants to hang out with but the big fuzzy cuddly dressed in a yellow suit have D. What's going to be better than that? <laughs> And as soon as we came down the steps, it was in Prince's Club. Mm -hmm. So you used to enter it and you had to walk down. So when you we walked down to the dance floor, her dancers saw Hev, and they went to get Janet. And I saw the whole thing. And mm -hmm. I hit Hev, like, see? And so by the time we hit the dance floor, Janet Jackson was standing right there to greet Hev. Took him by the hand. I ain't see him no more for the rest of the night. <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was up in Janet Jackson land. Wow. Yeah, but but and Russ, then he made the record. It's yeah. all right with me. Yeah, with Janet. But even before that, like Russell didn't didn't see the talent, or you True. snatched him up. True. Like talk about what, the, what when, made him special as an artist. Like what, what well, did you what realize made, he could be? What, really what made talented? have special is Hev was charming. So the first time I met him, I met him over the phone. He called looking for uh, Russell Simmons, and I said he's not here. He said, "Well, can I talk to you?" And I said, "Okay." He said, "Who are you?" I said, "I'm Andre Hira." He said. Andre Harrell, Dr. Jekyll? I said, yeah. He said, can I call you back tomorrow? <laughs> I said, okay. So the next, he had to get himself together because he was like, oh, it's on now. <laughs> mm. So he called me back the next day, and he didn't admit it, immediately go on the pitch. He asked me, because uh, I, I probably answered the phone like, hello? He said, yo, you you sound kind of rushed. Is this a good time? What's going on with you? And he just started doing therapy. 
mm-hmm. and had me talking about what was going on with me at that point in the office. And so whenever someone does that to you and you realize you talk so much, you're ready to let them talk and listen. Mm-hmm. So when he started talking, I realized he was charming. So when he came down to see me at Rush, here was this big light skinned dude, him and Eddie F, with this great <laughs> like haircut. Like them light skinned dudes, Andre. We're just going to get to that. <laughs> with, with, with this great haircut. Like, my Vernon cats really pride themselves in having great haircuts. Mm. So, Hev came, you know, he was Jamaican, he had curls, his joint was pointed up. He was dressed in Coca Cola shirt, brand new Nikes, looking like he was from DC. I never saw him as uh, a fat boy. Like, I always ran the comparison that Hev D was like, Jackie Gleason, but mm-hmm. not like Ralph Cramden, the, the bus driver in the honeymoons. Mm-hmm. He was like, how sweet it is, Jackie Gleason with the corsage. Mm-hmm. And um, my goal was to make you not pay attention to his size by having him do slim man things. Like his suits were tailor made, so he, he never had a big man, tall man thing, because they would be three seasons behind. Mm-hmm. And that made him look retarded or fat. So I, I get whatever Giorgio Armani got, we're going to make him five of those. And then he could dance. And we hired Rosie Perez to choreograph him. Wow. wow. And once you take a 300-pound man and get him moving like he's light on his feet, you start <laughs> saying, go heavy, go heavy, go. And he was just a star. Right. Well, he looked like a star. He And the things he said, excuse me. No problem. Mm. Uh, the things he said, was so loving toward women. He um, he had a charm, the way he would talk about, I want somebody to love me for me. Girls are girls, they love me. I'm the old way lover, heavy D. Yeah. So sincerity, I guess? Yes, yeah. and, and, and vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and like a gentle giant. I remember standing um, in Houston outside of an arena, and we were there at 3 o'clock doing the sound check. And Hemp said, Watch this, Dre, watch this. So two girls coming, and uh, the girls come up, they stop, they say, hi, you have ED? They say, yeah. And they get ready to walk again, and they come back and say, can I hug you? And, he- and they they would hug Hev, and Hev said, they always want to hug me. Don't nobody want to. <laughs> 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 so, so um, Hev was just, even my first artist, he probably, as much as I taught him the record business, he probably taught me the record business because I had to manage him and, and get him from zero to hero. Yeah. And then he tried to you, run uptown for yeah, you. Yeah, right? Yes. Were you happy with how he took it over? I was so happy. So for real, I, I Lost happy, Boys? I was happy that he had the opportunity, yeah. Mm. Actually, that's actually, that's funny you mentioned Lost Boys. That's my favorite rap album of all time. Personal really? favorite rap album <laughs> is Lost Boys Legal Drug Money. I'm from mm. Queens. And so, it technically says Uptown, Andre. Yeah, because so. it, <laughs> it, it, to me, it encapsulates my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So that's like my favorite Mr. rap album. Cheeks. Mr. Cheeks. There you I was go. trying to say it too because he was asking me, you know, because I'm older, obviously. He was saying in that time when you guys were making that music, I was like, you know, you felt the energy that that was our sound. It was a New York sound. Mm-hmm. We, I didn't necessarily feel like I was calling a new Jack Swing. It just felt like it was ours and it was new and it was fresh. Mm-hmm. And then to me, the outside world was able to embrace it by that name. Oh, that's New Jack well, Swing. Well, New Jack Swing really died out like in the early 90s. And, and Hip Hop Soul took its place. Hmm. Yeah, Like Teddy Riley and God came out in 88. Keith Sweat and I Want It came out in 87. Dougie Fresh, the show, which was really the first New Jack Swing record mm-hmm. that Teddy Riley made. Yeah, That must have came out around uh, the winter of 86. Mm. But why yeah. But why do you think that your records have aged so well? Even though it, it has like a dated sound, but they still pop off today. Like when I play a guy record, it feels like I'm going out or, you know, the longevity lasts. Well, the 90s are like the black people's 70s. <laughs> like it's our era of chic partying. And those records, they evoke em- emotion a party emotion, mm. a good time emotion uh, that brings you back as soon as you hear it. Like, you hear Groove Me. Groove Me just changed R&B forever. You, see, you hear Groove Me sonically, and you see the Gucci girls coming out from the video. And then the other thing is that we had videos at that time, like BET was still young. Mm. BET must have started in 85. So in 1988, um, I had control of my visuals. Mm. So... 
there was nobody who was who wasn't young and black that could have input into my thing. So my thing would really hit you in the core. So it was it was the sound was new. Mm. Uh, it was it was of the time. The look was was a hundred percent pure, uh, ghetto fabulous. Uh, so when you hear when you hear those records now, it reminds you of when R and B was great. It reminds you when you was in the club dancing. Now, because when people dance, you don't realize da- dancing is different than just partying. Dancing and throwing your hands up in the air is like celebration, like mm. rejoice. So it hits you at a whole nother emotional high. Mm-hmm. So when you hear those records now, you're not going to the club and having that experience now. Mm, yeah. Those These records don't make you rejoice. These records in, in this generation, they don't really dance. And right. they don't act like they're celebrating in the way we celebrate it. Like they might be buying bottles, mm. but that's a front. We were celebrating. <laughs> right, right. And we weren't celebrating it's our birthday. We weren't celebrating our graduation, we were celebrating Friday night. Right. But it looked right. like he was cooking up these records to then present, because I think you said Puffy would present records to you every Monday morning. Like So it mm-hmm. seemed like you was cooking up these records, and then you would instantly get that gratification because you would bring them to the clubs and then get that reaction, well, right? Well, the way, the way I got my taste for, for music is by going to Bentley's. Bentley's was a club uh, on yep. 40th Street and Park Avenue that DJ Sugar Daddy used to DJ at. And all the bad chicks used to go there. And you supposedly <laughs> had to be 25 to get in. And I was 21, sneaking in. Sometimes I get That's in. That's why you wore the suit, Andre? Sometimes I get in, sometimes I wouldn't. Right. Uh, but the one thing I realized quickly is that when you go out to the club, it was the era of girls going out with four of their girlfriends, right? It'd be one cute one. The rest of them, <laughs> the rest of them, Some the, things never change. The rest of them be like, ah, you just dragged me out. I'm just going out. I don't really want to be here. So you ask the cute one to dance, she say no. You ask the friend sitting next to us to dance, she say no. Then you ask the other two. So it's like, no, 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 no. Then you feel like you don't turn around because you feel like the whole club must have just seen this. <laughs> <laughs> you go upstairs into the dark part, into the abyss and regroup, get your ego back. <laughs> and then you make an observation how the DJ plays. Because every DJ who plays the club plays a certain way. Mm. And a certain period, his hot records come on. So when his hot records would come on, like ain't nobody, I would know to be come from upstairs, downstairs to observation deck number one where you could see all the chicks and be standing right there, soon as Chuck Collin, doom, 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 and stick your hand mm-hmm. out. It was like automatic, like the universe would just be moving our hand towards mm-hmm. you. And I always wanted to make boy meet girl, girl meet boy records wow. that had that same effect, that had people getting on that dance floor. So for me, I always used to tell Puff, I said, you got to show them the dance you want them to do in the video. I said, because if you show them the dance, when the record comes on, you'll see that dance and you know you got them. Mm. Good point. Oh, that's crazy. What I want to know, too, is, did this happen under your watch, Horace Brown, the Jay-Z? Of course. That's what, so whose idea was to have Jay-Z on that remix? Because every time I hear that ADF. song. Okay. ADF. Okay. Every time I hear that bass line, it feels like Supper Club. Mm-hmm. I got to put on my good clothes or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, has got that done. Okay. Yeah, talk about Eddie. I feel like he doesn't get enough props. Uh, uh, he contributed. Eddie F., um, he's a producer. He started his own label. Um, he signed Pete Rock, CL Smooth. Mm. He signed Donnell Jones, who's one of my favorite club, mm. club records that he makes. Um, Eddie F. was also a New Jack Swing producer. Now, you got to understand... New Jack Swing wasn't was didn't stay around long. It was about a four year run. It was a rap. It just made an impact though. But it made an impact. So uh, Eddie F was 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 uh, pivotal at Uptown because he would make records not only for Hab but for other artists. Um, he taught Puff how to produce. Eddie F lived down the block from me, so when Puff had to leave my house, <laughs> he goes stay at Eddie F's house. He stayed at my house for a year. Stayed at Eddie F's house for a year. <laughs> So he was getting all sorts of university information. <laughs> so he became a producer out of that. Wow. Yeah. So Eddie F is definitely a pivotal Uptown member in terms of producer. Like, you got to say Teddy Riley in terms of creating our sound. Teddy Riley. Of course. Eddie F, Devante, and the Trackmasters. Not bad uh, lineup. Mm-hmm. Was there anyone that you passed on that blew up into this household name? People ask me that all the time, and the answer is no. <laughs> because it seems like as if you're... 
your win loss record is unprecedented. Well, no misses. Well, when you when you get hot, all right, and you're hot for a certain kind of thing. I was hot uh, for great singers and great artists. If you thought you were great, you wanted to be with me because mm. you knew I knew what to do with something great. So who was my competition? Like I was in a, I was in the hip hop soul category. I could do hip hop and I could do R and B. Def Jam didn't really do R and B. They did hip hop. Mm. There was nobody else really that could compete with me. Like Quincy Jones was Quincy Jones, but Quincy Jones was Quincy Jones. He wasn't of the Uptown era. He was of a super era that we don't know how that worked. Mm. We know mm. it worked with Michael Jackson, right? But we don't know uh, if it's gonna work with something that's starting on the ground that has to be built up. Do you think in this this era someone could come along a young Andre Harrell and build a in the a powerhouse like this a label like that? Well, to be honest, um, Young Money, Young Money yeah. came with Drake and Wayne and and Nicki Minaj. That's pretty good. Mm. Not bad at all. Cash Money's been around twenty years. Wow. Yeah. Cash Money's been around longer than Uptown. Like Birdman's a record man. <laughs> we can't. We can't say he's not. We can't say he's not. He got big stars and he got a lot of years of it now. Wow. Yeah. But did you get disenchanted with the music business? Because I know in 2011 you had uh, Harrell Records, but now you know it's really not that much activity going well, on. Well, the record business started to change in 2000, mm -hmm. so the the record sales had dropped 50 percent. So the whole industry as we knew it was changing, um, and technology was taking a, a bigger role. And so I've always been involved in television and film, so. The idea of, of Revolt TV just made sense for mm -hmm. me as a music person mm -hmm. to grow yeah. into the television production mm -hmm. side. So I always feel like I'm involved in music, but I'm just at a different spectrum now. Gotcha. And what are some of the goals besides the conference do you see for Revolt? You know, obviously now you guys kind of have your foundation now, like are really growing more and more. Like, what should people look out for Revolt in the future, you think? Additional programming, good music programming coming next year, mm -hmm. shows. More original programming. Mm -hmm. Original programming. Dope, dope. The B dot show. <laughs> right? <laughs> Here is my real. What I always want to know too, on the were you actively on the set of Strictly Business with One Hundred Percent? What was the vibe like? Strictly Business was originally made. I'm a, originally called Go Beverly. And Go you know who Beverly. Go Beverly was? Is Beverly Bond ah, from yeah. Black Girl Rocks? Now, how did she? How would she go, Beverly? I had a crush on her friend, and she was my <laughs> trainer. Beverly Bond was my trainer. And the and and the um, plan was all right. I'm gonna get you off super slim, and you're gonna go get the girl. And we became friends. And I would take her out with me at night. And when she started dancing, whether it be street dudes, whether it be bankers, whether it be white boys, they all loved her. And I started to notice that two things bring social classes and different ethnic groups together: mm. women and drugs. You smoke a <laughs> joint, you can be smoking a joint with, yeah. the, with the Duke of Windsor. Uh, hey, what, what's that you got over there, Doc? <laughs> yeah, I can sit down and join you. All of a sudden, don't matter what your differences right. are. And if there's a chick there, do you know her? Yes, she's a friend of mine. All of a sudden, this dude is your friend. And so the movie was about a girl who brought all these people together. She brought... Um, Tommy Lee, who was um, in the mail, mail room, right? With with um, what was his name? God, dog, the banker. His, uh, the real name, I think, is Joseph. The guy who played Wayman. Wayman Tisdale. Then Wayman Tisdale. Wait, yeah. Wayman Tisdale. Look at you, Vita. I, I love uh, the movie. Uh, <laughs> so brought those two together, and they were going to be an unlikely pair. He was like an Ivy League guy, right. and he was like a high school dropout. So because he knew um, Holly Berry in the movie there was a reason for them to become friends. Right. And and I was experiencing that in my world. Mm. Like I had all these Ivy League bankers, I had all these people I knew from Harlem, and I would put people together. And the music for me was Michael Beverly. Mm. That brought people together. And I wanted to show a movie that showed all the social classes blending together. Great movie, man. Well, how was Hallie on the set? Like, was she was cool? That was like a first starring role, too. She was unassuming, she was cool. Wow. She was easy going. She's still easy going. You don't make a lot of stars here, Andre, man. Well, we, star, man. We, came, we, we came up at the right time. <laughs> Knock on wood. Right. All right, but we're going to be grooming the new stars, man. Once again, Revolt Conference. Let them know the, the dates. RMC, Revolt Music Conference, down in Miami at the Eat Rock. 
October 13th to 16th, where music meets social media meets uh, technology for innovation for the future. There's over 70 panelists. Um, Nas this year will be getting the um, the Jimmy IV Revolt Icon Award. Leo Cohen will be doing a keynote. Julie Greenwald will be doing a Q&A with myself. DJ Khaled Woo, will be down there Khaled, talking Khaled. about social cloth talk, media. Cloth talk yeah, down there? Yeah. <laughs> He'll be explaining how he did it, how you can do it. Uh, we'll have a &R panels, management panels. Beyonce's dad, he's on the panel. Matthew Knowles. Matthew Knowles. Knowles. Um, we have a social media panel. We have music and marketing panels. Uh, if you want to be in the music business and you want to understand where we are today, the World Music Conference is the place to be. So where can someone con like register or whatever? Like you go to our website. Uh, revoltmusicconference.com So you're not going to sleep for three days and where are you going to vacation right after this is over? <laughs> uh, I, I don't vacation right after it's over um, because I live in L.A. right now. Oh, so, there you go. You like in L.A. <laughs> I don't love L.A. like that. I love New York. Yeah, but it seems go. like that's where it's at right now. Right? A lot of cats left us, man. But it, it's nothing like New York. I mean, nothing like New York. New York, you can feel yourself mm. like you... You can feel this interview, like you can walk on the street and somebody will tell you, I heard you yeah. on the show and blah, blah, right. blah, blah. Yeah. And L.A., you and you in your car. Yeah. Mm. So you, you're you not going to get approached that much. Yeah. Right. So you feel kind of um, isolated a little bit. Gotcha. If you're used to being in New York and walking down mm. the street. And like for me, like a bus driver will see me who went to high school with me. <laughs> Trey! <laughs> Trey! And it'd be yeah. cross 57th Street. I'm used to that kind of no. And to your credit, I think like, as I think back on it, I think Uptown Records was the first label that made me feel like this is New York. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. just by the energy of the music and everything, just being it's a, it was a different experience being from New York and feeling these records and knowing these records. What's the fox? What's why the fox logo? The fox logo. Was the, what, you was mean the cat? The cat. Yeah. Oh, there's a cat. Yeah. Always thought it was a fox. <laughs> <laughs> You've been on point all day. <laughs> I mean, super on. Waving this day up. <laughs> I fucked up. <laughs> but at this point, though, Audrey, what's keeping you inspired? What's keeping you going? Out? You could sit back and ride off into the sunset. Culture. Um, I'm always, I'm, I've always been interested in what people are doing, what people are saying, and how they do it. Mm. And I think that, that's the, and any record man will have to be interested in culture to be successful, to stay successful. Mm. Like, once, you, once you, you don't take the time to listen to something new or listen to a young person's point of view, um, you're done. Mm. You will not be moving forward into tomorrow. Mm. I just stayed interested, mm. and I'm a good listener. Thank hopefully. you, man. I hope they listen to that. No, they're gonna listen to this rap radar podcast, Absolutely. man. They're gonna enjoy it, man. We gotta thank you, Andre. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. One more time, Andre Harrell. Uptown's mm -hmm. kicking it. Thank rap you, man. We, we out of here, man. Rap radar podcast. Yep.